Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Joost Schotterhoek, I'm the director here at the Vancouver Maritime Museum, and I think it's a good tradition that we start beautifully in time. And you are here in time, so why don't we start indeed? Um, and it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to the Vancouver Maritime Museum. Um, it is, I started last July, last uh, summer in July, and it's our objective as a museum to organize at least two public programs per month. So please stay tuned and sign up for our newsletter if you'd like. And uh, we feel privileged to uh, host uh, this, this program for this afternoon. Uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I just want to welcome you here and introduce uh, Dennis Chen, who will then introduce the speaker of today. So thanks again. Please um, come by anytime, and I would love to see you during one of our future public programs. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Dennis? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Vancouver Maritime Museum. My name is Dennis Chen, and I am the program supervisor here at the museum. Thank you all for coming. Today, we're going to have a presentation from the Landscapes for Justice Group, who will be presenting a brand new book called Witness to Loss. Today's presentation is the first of a series of lectures and talks based on our Lost Fleet exhibit. I'm really looking forward to today's talk. On behalf of the Vancouver Maritime Museum, I would like to welcome Landscapes of Injustice, a group dedicated to telling the story and coming to terms with the forced sale of Japanese Canadian owned property and the uprooting of over 21,000 people of Japanese ancestry from coastal British Columbia. The Landscapes of Injustice group asks why and how the disposition, disposition occurred, who benefited from it, and how it will be remembered and forgotten in subsequent decades. Thank you, and now let's hear more about Witness and Laws, and I can turn this over to Dr. Rodin Chandra Ross. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Jordan Stanger Ross. I'm Project Director of Landscapes of Injustice and Associate Professor of History at the University of Victoria. And I'm going to talk today about the book Witness to Loss. I'm going to reflect a little more broadly on this uh, history. And then we also have another contributing author to the book, Masako Fukawa, who's going to speak about her family's relationship uh, with this history. And then we'll have some presentations from, uh, from students at the end. I want to thank uh, Silk Road, which provided the tea. If you guys haven't taken the tea in the back yet, please uh, do. They've uh, donated to a couple of our events now, and we're big fans of the tea. Uh, Sydney Furman in the back helped to organize this, and Mike Abe, and Dennis, of course. And thank you so much to the museum uh, for hosting. Us. I want to start with the words of Kishizo Kimura, whose memoir is featured in this book. The 8th of January, 1942. One month after the outbreak of the Pacific War, Major J.A. Motherwell, Chief Supervisor of Fisheries, contacted me. He urgently wanted to have a private consultation with me at the Ministry of Fisheries. He told me that the provincial government wanted to increase the food supply. They planned to promptly release impounded Nikkei fishing boats, Japanese Canadian owned fishing boats, into the hands of Hakujin and Dojin fishermen, white and native fishermen, so that they could go out fishing. An order in council was being drafted for this purpose. To facilitate the sale or rental of these boats, they were creating a special committee. A judge would be appointed as chairman with a representative from the Ministry of Defense as another member. Mr. Motherwell was to recommend myself as a representative from the Nikkei community and urged me to accept. Witness to Loss is a book about the events that followed from that conversation. It's an unusual book about an unusual story, the story of Kishizo Kimura, a man who served on two controversial committees during the 1940s, <laughs> committees that destroyed the industry within which he made his living and destroyed the neighborhood in which he had lived for many years. Because of these committees and the wider administration of uh, Japanese Canadian owned property, because of these committees, Japanese Canadians had nothing to return to in 1949 when the internment was finally ended. Because of these committees and the work of the government, Japanese Canadians were forced to use their equity in land, 
businesses, and fishing vessels to support themselves during the 1940s. In the 1960s and early 1970s, Kishizo Kumar wrote a memoir about his participation in these events. The memoir takes up about a third of the book, carefully and elegantly translated by Matsuki Masutani and published here for the first time. Uh, the memoir tells the remarkable story of Kishizo Kimura's experience of the 1940s. In July 2012, I walked into the Nikkei National Museum in Burnaby for the first time in search of Kishizo Kimura. All I really knew was his name. I had seen his name in government documents in the Library and Archives of Canada, often followed by the sentence, a person of the Japanese race, and these documents describe Kishizo Kimura as having approved the forced sale of Japanese Canadian-owned fishing vessels and real estate. But who was Kishizo Kimura? At the Nikkei National Museum, I met their passionate archivist, Linda kuomoto Reed, and other members of the staff there who brought me remarkable documents to answer that question. Through the sources that they provided, I was able to get to know Kishizo Kimura a little. Some of Kishizo Kimura's family is here today and uh, knows much more uh, than I was able to learn. Um, but Kishizo Kimura was an immigrant as a child with his parents and stayed on after other members of his family returned home to Japan or died. He lived and worked with other, in, within the Japanese Canadian neighborhood in the east end of Vancouver, made a living within the fishing industry, organizing fishers at exports, married and eventually raised five children. He worked hard and was building a life and was still a young man in 1941. And then war with Japan. And then the fishing vessels were impounded. And then a call in January 1942 proposing that he participate in government committees. The most remarkable of the documents that we found at the Nikkei National Museum was the memoir itself devoted almost entirely to his experience within the committees and contextualizing that experience, explaining his actions. It's a document that is part uh, an act of witnessing, part an act of testifying, and part an act of justifying his own actions. It's a very rare source for historians to be curious about an individual, to be curious about their participation in particular events, and to find an 80-page document written about their participation in these events. So it's a very exciting uh, thing to discover. And it allows us to answer a question that's hard for historians to answer through official documents. What were the people who participated thinking about their participation? What at least did they think later? I want to read another section of the memoir, also from the book, of course, in which Kizuzo Kimura situates his actions or explains them in relation to younger generations of Japanese Canadians in the post-war era when he's writing. In a message to the second and third generations, he writes, from the current perspective, at a time when protests and demonstrations are the trend, there might be some who laugh at the Nikkei who conducted themselves with silence and obedience for decades. He continues a little further down. Depending on the time period, the situation, and social standing, the outcomes are different. There might also be different opinions among us. However, I just want young people to understand that the Issei were by no means ignorant or stupid. At the risk of sounding too insistent, I would like you to understand that the Issei were not an inferior ethnic group. They had to take care of their families in Japan. Even if they studied, sacrificing their families at home, there was no way for them to find good employment. They did not have suffrage, their English was not good enough, and their fields of employment were limited because of exclusionary practices. They had to take care of their family in Canada, and they somehow built up a base in the face of a vicious anti-Nikkei campaign. You might laugh at my slim advice, but I would like to urge you not to form an unconscious ethnic self-hatred. Reading this and the memoir that surrounds it, I felt I was seeing a person trying to justify their own actions, situating them within a wider generation, 
trying to uh, explain to younger generations how it was that a Japanese Canadian could participate in committees forcing the sale of property, participate in committees that left lasting scars on the community. In the memoir, he provides a detailed reconstruction of the choices and events of this process. It was written before redress, written before the government documents detailing these same processes were publicly available, written decades before any historians had worked with the documents that Kishizu Kimura had in his own personal collection. He wrote this memoir in Japanese and urged his children to donate it to an archive. So what was I then to make of this? It was not something about which I could come to easy conclusions, and I wanted to talk to others about it. The first people I talked to were Ed and Doris Kimura, who had donated the memoir to the Nikkei National Museum. Ed, Kishizo's son, couldn't read Japanese. It was a real privilege to be able to return the memoir to Ed in a language that he was able to read, and then to speak with him and Doris about the memoir. I thought long and hard about Kimura after meeting his son, and my thoughts form the introduction of this uh, book, an introduction that situates the um, memoir within Kishizo Kimura's personal history somewhat, within the wider history of British Columbia and of Japanese Canadians, and in which I try to sort through some of my thoughts about the history uh, that I discovered here. I'll read you a small part of the introduction now that uh, conveys at least some of the um, more lasting, for me, uh, uh, thoughts that, I've had, that I had around the memoir. So I wrote then, almost three quarters of a century later, caution is required in judgment of the character of individuals placed in difficult and indeed often impossible situations by the racist policies of mid 20th century states. Recalling his role in the trials of accused Nazi collaborators in post-war Israel, Supreme Court Justice Chaim Cohen comments, I could not rid myself of the feeling that we are altogether unable to judge these people, to put ourselves in their place at all, as one must in order to judge a person. Without suggesting equivalence between the forced sale of property in Canada and mass murder in Europe, I nonetheless gravitate to a similar perspective as I approach figures like Kimura, who became entangled in Canada's experiment with mass race-based incarceration, deportation, and property dispossession. My challenge has been to understand, as well as I can, the wartime era, the enduring damages caused by racist policy, and the ways in which individuals grappled with and communicated their own experiences of some of Canada's most difficult history. I felt sympathetic to Kimura. I wasn't sure that if confronted with a similar choice, I would have acted differently. I felt sure that when he received that call in January of 1942, he was forced to make a terrible choice, a more terrible choice than I myself have ever been forced to make. And I tried to understand his actions from that perspective. But I knew from the outset that this was not the only perspective that would be taken on Kishizu Kimura and his actions. I knew that other perspectives were necessary, and the complexity and difficulty of this source launched a national research project. Witness to Loss is the first book produced, as uh, has already been introduced, by the Landscapes of Injustice Research Project, of which I'm the director. Landscapes of Injustice is a major project built on conversations, built on partnership. Its focus is the dispossession of the property of Japanese Canadians and a large number of people asking together and answering in various ways, where does the dispossession of the property of Japanese Canadians fit into the larger history of British Columbia, fit into the larger history of Canada? Those conversations started at the Nikkei National Museum in 2012 when the staff brought me the uh, uh, memoir and other documents about Kishizu Kimura and conveyed to me how important to the Japanese Canadian community and also to that institution itself this history of property loss was and how many questions about it still remain unresolved. After that initial conversation, <coughs> the, this, these discussions expanded to the Royal BC Museum which became very involved in this project at an early juncture, wanting to tell a more diverse history of the province than that institution has done historically. 
A federal museum, the Canadian Museum of Immigration in Halifax, joined this project as it became a national museum of immigration to Canada, wanting to be able to tell stories of immigrants and their children from coast to coast in Canada. Other universities joined the project, Ryerson University, Simon Fraser, University uh, of Winnipeg, University of Alberta, and other universities as well. These are institutional partners who bring their expertise of the, of the faculty and staff who work there, as well as institutional investment in being connected with this history. The project was joined by three other major Japanese Canadian organizations in addition to the Nikkei National Museum. The Vancouver Japanese Language School in the east end of Vancouver is the only property in that neighborhood, the neighborhood for which Kishizu Kimura was on a, uh, a committee overseeing the forced sale of property there, the only property in that neighborhood that wasn't sold and that still remains an historic institution within the Japanese Canadian community in the east end today. The National Association of Japanese Canadians, which negotiated redress in, 19, in the 1980s with the federal government. The, the Japanese, uh, the Japanese uh, Canadian Cultural Center in Toronto, probably the largest Japanese Canadian organization in the country. And then we were joined by other partners, academic associations, and supported at our host institution, the University of Victoria, uh, to conduct a major national project reaching over seven years of activity, of which we're now at the midpoint. This collection of institutions to work on this history was also uh, a collection of people and of expertise. The project includes Eric Adams, professor of law at the University of Alberta, who's looking at, who's placing this history within the larger constitutional history of Canada, asking how the forced sale of Japanese Canadian owned property became legal and in what respects it was also illegal. Pamela Sugiman at Ryerson University, uh, a distinguished oral historian, is leading our efforts to collect hundreds of stories of Japanese Canadians and others, bystanders and witnesses in British Columbia who saw these events unfold within their communities. Nicholas Blomley, who's in the room today, a uh, internationally distinguished property scholar, has helped us to understand Japanese Canadians' own ideas of properties and the government's uh, conception of uh, property in this era. Audrey Kobayashi, a long-standing scholar within the Japanese Canadian community and activist, has worked on Japanese migration to Canada, experiences here, and the exile of Japanese Canadians in 1946, when some 4,000 Japanese Canadians were exiled. Sherry Kajiwara, the director, curator of the Nikkei National Museum, has helped us to bring community-based records like these ones that are featured in this, like this one featured in this book, into the project. And she'll begin now to curate a traveling exhibit that will travel from coast to coast to partner institutions and other institutions uh, in the coming years. Mike Perry Whittingham and Greg Mianyaga are secondary and primary school teachers developing teacher resources out of this material to be used in classrooms across Canada. And Mike Abe, who I've already mentioned and who's in the back of the room, uh, helps to coordinate all of this through the project office at the University of Victoria. So it's a large collective of people with varied backgrounds, perspectives, and interests. And the project doesn't try to speak with one voice or to tell one history uh, of the dispossession of Japanese Canadians. Instead, we've tried to nurture many perspectives and to hear many voices. And the book, Witness to Loss, is exemplary of that ethos within the project. Pam Sugiman, the oral historian I've mentioned, uh, helped to found the book, suggesting that we could do something collective uh, with this important resource. And she and I then worked together to recruit uh, six contributors, three of us in the end Nikkei, uh, three non-Nikkei, three people who received this history within their families, and three, like myself, who read about it and learned it in conversation. Masako Fukawa, who you're here, you'll hear from in a few minutes, uh, contributed a chapter reflecting on her family experience uh, on her family experience in relation to the memoir. Tim Stanley, an historian of race, racism, and anti-racism at the University of Ottawa, reflected on how the memoir illuminates larger structures of racism uh, and racial domination. Vic Saskowicz, a sociologist at McMaster University, argues that Kishizo Kimura is not that unusual. 
that many other people in the history of Canada found themselves in these in-between positions, working with uh, government officials sometimes in uh, relation to policies that victimize their own communities. Laura Matacoro writes about the memoir in relation to her grandmother's experience of Canadian citizenship, and students contribute to the volume. Will Archibald and Monique Ulysses producing an, an index that helps to provide short biographies for all of the people mentioned in the book and a uh, background for laws and enactments mentioned. At the Nikkei National Museum, or in collaboration with the Nikkei National Museum, John Endo Greenway, Kip Jorgensen, and, uh, and the museum itself produce a uh, fantastic uh, website that Kip, who's one of our RAs, will show you in a few minutes, um, that uh, uh, provides the whole uh, memoir in English and in Japanese. It's an edited form uh, here that uh, has a photographic essay that he helped to create. Has includes an oral history where you can hear Kishizu Kimura speaking in his own uh, voice and is a real excellent uh, accompaniment to the volume. All of our work is done as well in community consultation. Community consultation happens on our project through the participation of four major institutions with mandates within the Japanese Canadian community, and happens through the participation of uh, a community council that we've created specifically for this purpose. Some of the members of the community council are here. Sally Ito, a, a distinguished writer living in Winnipeg within the community. Art Mickey, who represented the National Association of Japanese Canadians in negotiation with the federal government in 1988. Uh, Mary Kitagawa, who some of you uh, may know for her activism here in Vancouver, including her work with uh, UBC to uh, provide some uh, uh, redress for uh, students who were expelled from that institution in the 1940s. And the chair of our uh, community council is Vivian uh, Wakabayashi Rignerstadt, a long-standing uh, educator and, and uh, uh, leader within the community. Students, as they are in this volume, are represented in all of our work. You'll meet a number of students at the end of this uh, session, see some of the research that they conduct. Everything that our project does, students uh, participate in. We've worked with some 50 students. Uh, they develop a passion uh, for this history. They develop expertise uh, within the history. They do our primary research. They write up research results. They communicate uh, uh, publicly about these uh, results and within the press. Everything that the project does is done with uh, and through uh, students. Our project aims to produce academic results like uh, um, academic papers that most of you in the room probably uh, don't want to read. Uh, and, uh, but we also uh, communicate in, within what we hope is a public conversation uh, about these topics and we've had Significant interest from the really from the start of the project in in this work uh, by, by public news outlets. You can see some national and local press uh, here. Uh, it's been my sense in presenting in rooms like this in BC since the very early stages of the project that British Columbians certainly feel uh, connected with this history. Uh, that there's engagement with this uh, past, and we're working to make that also a more national uh, conversation. Our work will result in a traveling museum exhibit, as I've mentioned, that will show first in the Vancouver area and Burnaby, travel across the country, and then have a finale exhibit at the Royal BC Museum. We'll create a public history website to tell this uh, history through new media. Uh, an archival website will make all the thousands of files and documents, as well as hundreds of interviews and laws, uh, land title searches on the properties owned by Japanese Canadians publicly available to Japanese Canadian families and a wider uh, public to research this past. We'll create teacher resources, as I've mentioned, and we'll continue trying to foster uh, a national conversation through media and outreach. Our work is uh, motivated by a shared conviction that this is a history that all Canadians should know, that it's a story about the violation of human and civil rights at a time of perceived insecurity, about measures taken in the name of national defense that made no one safer about the enduring harms of mass displacement and the loss of home and the resilience of people confronting injustice. And it's a conviction within our research project this is, that this is an increasingly relevant area of research and reflection. <laughs> So out of this approach of many people working in, um, in, in together and in conversation with one another, uh, I think we've gained new insight into the forced sale of the Japanese-Canadian fishing fleet as uh, depicted in this event. And the book in, in this uh, museum, in, in the museum exhibit. 
The book includes, as one of those voices, my interpretations and um, perspectives. And I want to take a moment to make an argument that is perhaps unfamiliar to some uh, members of the audience and that I've already worn masks. I would think some contributors to the volume would disagree with me about. We have uh, a, a project that invites, as I said, uh, many voices and sometimes they don't always speak in harmony. Uh, so I want to take a moment to suggest that the forced sale of fishing vessels is in some respects both the best and the worst of this sordid history of the forced sale of Japanese Canadian owned property. The best and the worst of this history. So let me try to explain, and especially in what respect could anyone possibly suggest that this is the best of uh, this history? And then I'll come to, to why I might suggest it's the worst of this history. So uh, the best of this history. To understand why, uh, at least I might suggest that this is the best of this history uh, of, of, of government actions in this period that dispossessed Japanese Canadians, I want to point to the order and council that resulted in the dispossession of fishing vessels in January of 1942, January 14, 1942. So under the War Measures Act, which came into effect at the beginning of the Second World War, uh, government took action not through normal parliamentary process, but rather through effectively executive order through the cabinet. And what that really meant, because hundreds of these were passing, you can see that on January 13, 1942, this is the 288th Order and Council passed that year. So in the not quite two weeks of, since they got back from ski holidays, uh, uh, cabinets passed almost 300 orders in council. So for the most part, cabinets not carefully reviewing these. They're written by staff, by bureaucrats within the federal uh, government. So, uh, and this order in council created the law which generated the forced sale of Japanese Canadian owned property. And it's a very interesting, very distinctive uh, perhaps unique, I haven't read the, all the thousands of orders in council that were passed during this period, but perhaps unique order in council. So you can see here the text of the order in council with, reach, with, with, with reach which research assistants of ours, students of ours, digitized at Library and Archives Canada. These are the kinds of documents that will be available through our archival website. You can see first that the, the, the committee is constituted here. And here you can see, the, the, so we have the reference to the judge, Sidney Smith, B.L. Johnson, and Kishizo Kimura. This is one of those government documents in which I first saw this name, Kishizo Kimura. And so this, um, this order and council constitutes that committee and empowers them, empowers them through specific terms to make arrangements as well make it possible for the present owners of detained vessels to freely, and I, this is my emphasis, to freely negotiate for charters, leases, or sales of such vessels as they own. This is distinctive in a couple of ways. Unlike the forced sales that will follow and the orders and council that govern the, the forced sales, sales that will follow, this is to be done with the consent of owners. There's no power here for the uh, committee to force the sale of fishing vessels. They do do that, and we'll come to that in a moment, but the terms don't permit that, actually. This is a free negotiation, so that's the first the first distinctive aspect of this order and council, uh, or this aspect of the order and council. The second is that it contempla contemplates charters and leases. So Japanese Canadians could, under the terms of this order and council, decide not to sell their property, not to sell their fishing vessels in this instance, but we can imagine that extended to houses, uh, to businesses, to other uh, forms of property, not to sell them, but to lease or charter them for the duration of the internment. Both of those aspects are distinctive in this order and council. Those aspects of the, of the order and council follow from a rather remarkable preamble in which the government states the necessity of this law in ways that are unlike the preambles of any of the other laws that I've seen in this area. So here's the preamble. The owners of these vessels, though being of Japanese origin, are Canadian citizens whose productive power by virtue of this ownership contributed significantly to the fishing industry. So here's an order in council that names Japanese Canadians as Canadian citizens and that suggests that they've made major contributions to British Columbia, to Canada, to the industry within which they're working. 
And the order of counsel continues, the preamble continues in ways that are remarkable within the history of lawmaking in this period. Because of this, because they're Canadian citizens of Japanese origin, not Japanese race, which we'll see in most of the orders in council, of Japanese origin, because they're Canadian citizens of Japanese origin, therefore, the measures must take due regard for the equity of Japanese Canadian owners. Due regard for the equity of Japanese Canadian owners. I've not seen Japanese Canadian, that phrase which is commonplace now, I've not seen that phrase Japanese Canadian used in any other context in an order uh, in council. Japanese Canadians, Japanese Canadian owners who's contributed to Canada. This order in council came uh, before uh, came before the ordered uprooting and internment of all Japanese Canadians. That would follow later in March. And it suggests an alternative path that this history might have taken. An alternative path within which security concerns were balanced by a recognition of Japanese Canadian citizenship. An alternative path in which the response to the perceived security threats in Pacific Canada were, was, was measured. Uh, a path that, for example, might have included the internment, the uprooting and internment of a small percentage of the population, uh, as was the case for Italian and German nationals uh, in, in the rest of Canada. This order in council is formulated by people who, uh, who have a respect for Japanese Canadian property, Japanese Canadian citizenship, and had their views uh, prevail, then maybe a different history, in fact, unfolds. But that's not, of course, what occurred. Instead, a different vision uh, prevailed shortly within government, and order in council 1665, and that's the, so it's the 1665th order in council passed in 1942. We've got another two months. There's been a lot of government activity, of course. And this order in council, 1665, creates the British Columbia Security Commission that will oversee the uprooting and internment of Japanese Canadians and vests all of their property, all of their property in, the, in, in a federal body called the custodian of enemy property, all of their homes. Uh, businesses, uh, personal uh, belongings, uh, ceremonial and religious uh, possessions, every possession that Japanese Canadians couldn't carry with them to internment is through this order in council vested in the authority of the custodian of enemy property to do with what the custodian sees fit. And here's the preamble of this order in council, which is much more typical of the era, and I'll let you read that for yourselves. So here we don't see Japanese Canadian citizens. We don't see the contributions of Japanese Canadians to British Columbia or otherwise. We don't see people of Japanese origin. Rather, it's the security necessities of the uh, coast and people of the Japanese race, all of whom will be uprooted and interned under these provisions. So that's the history that we live with, instead of the one suggested as a possibility by Order in Council 288. <coughs> now, 288 itself failed. Japanese Canadian interests were not protected by Order in Council 288, and Japanese Canadians were not left, in fact, to freely negotiate charters, leases, or sales. Instead, this Order in Council comes, the vision with which, uh, uh, with which it's implemented comes to prevail and uh, Order in Council 288 fails. It's impossible to freely negotiate sales under the conditions of mass uprooting. So the circumstances make it impossible for owners to meaningfully negotiate their own sales. But also the committee, the committee that was created under Order in Council 288 breaks the law and forces a fail, the, the sale of uh, Japanese Canadian vessels. And that's the committee of which Kishizo Kimura is a part. In response to what the committee calls recalcitrant owners, that committee decided in May of 1942 to force the sale of the remaining vessels 
uh, against the will of owners. So several hundred owners objected to the sales, either, we don't know all of their reasons, but either because the prices offered were too low or in protest to the government uh, policies. And the committee decides that it will force a sale above the objections of these uh, owners. And this was something for which it did not have authority. In a post-war inquiry into this topic, government lawyers themselves uh, admitted this. Uh, submitting a brief to the Byrd Commission in the post-war, uh, government lawyers uh, explained that the vessels were not vested in the committee and that the committee had no power of sale without the owner's consent. That those are quotes. Government lawyers continued even more explicitly uh, to note that when committees, when the committee decided to force the sale of vessels, quote, the committee decided to do something for which they had no legal authority. And that's the only admission in all of the property sales of everything that Japanese, Canadian, Japanese Canadians own. That's the only admission that the government's actions were illegal on its own terms. And so in some senses, the forced sale of fishing vessels is the worst of this history in being truly illegal sales, and sales, moreover, that set the precedent for ones that were to come. This is some of the first property of Japanese Canadians forcibly sold, and when other forms of property were sold, officials drew directly on the precedent of the fishing vessels to argue that it was legitimate and uh, legal uh, to sell the property of Japanese Canadians. So it's a key, key precedent. So what uh, lessons do I then take from this? Uh, I take that there was uh, an alternative path. There was an alternative route in which important aspects of citizenship were respected, where property was preserved, where Japanese Canadian communities were not permanently effaced by government policy. I take that this option existed within government and had strong proponents, proponents who objected forcefully when in fact all Japanese Canadian owned property was sold without their consent. The authors of 288, and certainly one author, objected forcefully when he saw the larger direction of policy. The history of the fishing vessels uh, shows us this alternative uh, path, what might have been, and that's in a sense what, why I argue is the best of this history, and then what was this blatantly illegal precedent setting for sale. And history turned in this direction because of the choices of people, people who included Kishizo Kimura. And to grapple seriously with this history, as we tried to do in this book, is to think seriously about racism and to think seriously about the institutions of government, but also the people uh, within them, the people who make the decisions uh, of government. And the book tries to tell this story on those different uh, levels and to tell a complex story. And I'll just end uh, with a concluding thought that I had uh, in the introduction again, moving through this larger context and, and that history that I've just conveyed. Kimura's memoir offers a unique glimpse into an important moment in the history of race in 20th century Canada. A memoir of a person in a key position within the dispossession process, it opens a rare window into the operation of Canadian policy. A document of the participation of a Japanese Canadian in actions that victimize his own community, it illuminates the complex political history of racist law. An ambivalent and uneasy document, it conveys the difficulty of communicating political violence, especially across historical change. The internment of Japanese Canadians has been told, by and large, in black and white, and rightly so. It's a history of profound harms in which there are unmistakable perpetrators and definite victims. Kimura's memoir, Far From Absolving Guilt, instead intersects with other sources in conveying the profound and enduring human impacts of such historical eras. The internment forced itself upon Kimura, as it did upon other Japanese Canadians. But when his life was interrupted by Canadian officials, he received a troubling proposition. Kimura accepted. His memoir challenges us to understand such choices to grapple with their implications, and to join in their difficult telling. 
I want to turn now to Masako Fukawa, who's going to speak about her own family's relationship with this history. Masako Fukawa has a long, distinguished uh, career in the area as an independent uh, scholar and as a school teacher, administrator, and principal. Mas lived in Steveston until 1942 when her family was uprooted, and we're very proud on our project to be able to work with and grateful to be able to work with people who remember uh, this history. We're, uh, we really benefit from those perspectives. Mass herself is a, a long-time narrator of this history. She's worked hard to tell this history through teacher resources, through uh, in classes, and also in her award-winning book with her husband, Stan Fukawa, The Spirit of the Nikkei Fleet. Mass, it's my pleasure to have you up here in London. Problem is, can I? <laughs> 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 uh, well, um, I hope you can hear me anyway. Okay. Thank you, Jordan. That, that was really um, a comprehensive history produced um, in such a way that things made sense to me. So you often wonder, well, why did such and such happen? Um, but anyway. <laughs> well, maybe I should stand, stand on <laughs> um, I'd like to describe what the loss meant to me, Kay Fishers, and the families, including my own family, um, and conclude with some reflections. I'd be interested to hear your comments, and if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them, at least try to answer them. Uh, for Nikkei in the fishing industry, events folded rapid, unfolded rapidly with the bombing at Pearl Harbor. It was like riding a tsunami. Within 48 hours, all fishing vessels owned by Japanese Canadians were ordered to return to the nearest port. There they were immobilized, seized, and unbeknownst to them, ready to be sold off to non-Japanese. Over 1,100 vessels were rounded up, and, um, and among them were my grandfather's cod boat and my father's salmon trawler. My family has been in the fishing industry since 1893, and the, with the arrival of my paternal grandfather in Steveson from Mio Village in Wakayama Prefecture near Osaka. My maternal grandfather arrived a decade later in answer to his elder brother's call, who wrote and said, come and join me um, in Steepstone. Like all other Nikkei who entered the fishery, he spent the first three years as a puller or assistant fisherman to an already licensed fisherman. After he fulfilled the three-year re residency requirement, he became eligible and applied to become a naturalized British subject, which was Canadian citizenship at that time. This certificate of naturalization enabled him to acquire an independent fishing license. Strange as it may seem today, on this official document are written the license numbers, um, the years they were issued, and the initials of the inspectors. The earliest is dated 1912 and the latest 1941. My father was born at the Steveson Japanese Fishing, um, at the Japanese Fisherman's Hospital in Steveson. He was a Nisei and second generation to enter the fishery. My brother became the third generation to become a fisher. If it were possible to make a living in fishing today, he would still be fishing. <laughs> Unlike the Issei and Issei generations, some say could enter any occupation or the professions, but he and his fellow fishers always tell me that fishing is in their blood. It's part of their DNA. So except for the years spent in internment, there has been a fissure in my family for most of the 20th century. War hysteria was not the sole contributor to the government actions of this period. 
Greece's policies and actions had been enforced for several decades since the Japanese first arrived. Some politicians saw the bombing, quote, as a heaven-sent heaven opportunity, unquote, to rid the Japanese from the province forever. Economic opportunism was another factor. The cancellation of the fishing licenses and the confiscation of their vessels meant that the livelihood of the Nikkei fishers was taken away. Their financial investment was also in ruins. The emotional cost was just as great, or perhaps even greater. The fisher's relationship with his boat was more than just a mere vessel by which to make a living. His boat was his companion, a refuge in stormy weather, his pride and joy, and a symbol of his success. Without it, according to one fisher, it was like being cut off at the root. Nikkei fishers cooperated with the Navy in the, in the roundup of their boats. It was a demonstration of their loyalty and of their confidence in Canada. They believed that they would be treated fairly and that they would be back on the water soon. Furthermore, non-compliance to them was a sign of disloyalty. Some in anger and others in despair watched as their boats were mishandled by the inexperienced sailors who had never been to sea. Fearing that their boats would be completely swamped and destroyed if they were towed in the fierce December storm, fishers from the Skeena, the coast, the central coast, and then for Island navigated their own boat to be impounded in Annieville near New Westminster. The, you'll see a panoramic photo uh, in the exhibition. It's quite impressive. The fishers were unaware of the government's intention to sell them, that they would never see their beloved boats again. As Jordan mentioned, in early 19, in January 1942, the Japanese Fishing Vessel Disposal Committee was established. Here again, Japanese instead of Japanese Canadian, and um, to become uh, to get a fishing license, you have to be Japanese Canadian. Kimura, Kishizo Kimura was a Japanese representative on the three-member uh, vessel disposal committee. The others were a judge on the Supreme Court, and another was a commander who represented the Ministry of Defense. Their mandate was to sell off the boats to non-Japanese as quickly as possible. With over a thousand boats coming onto the market within a very short period of time, the, bar, uh, the market became oversaturated. Consequently, <laughs> Now I'm as tall as Jordan. Uh, okay, so it was an oversaturated market, and consequently, it was a buyer's market, and boats were being bought for a fraction. Government officials presented the quick, quick action, the, the, the sell-off, as an advantage to the Nikkei fishers themselves. The speedy sale, they said, was to prevent the vessels from suffering further damage when, where they were impounded. Nikkei fishers just wanted their boats back and in good condition. In the process of writing about the industry, I interviewed Nikkei fishers and asked them what they could tell me about Mr. Kimura. I was surprised to learn that they were not aware of his role on the committee. Some recall that he worked in the fish saltery business. Kimura has worked as a bookkeeper and had helped to establish cooperatives for the processing and sale of salted herring and salmon. And at the start of the Second World War, he was the manager of both organizations. When I mentioned to some fishers that Kimura was a member of the Japanese Vessel Disposal Committee, they were surprised. I was puzzled 
uh, by their response, but came to understand why this may be the case. Kimura himself had very little direct dealings with the fishers. This unpleasant task was being performed by the Japanese Liaison com Committee, a, a tier below the Disposal Committee. It consisted of four leaders of the Nikkei fishing organizations that represented the districts of Fraser, Skeena, West Coast of Vancouver Island, and the Central Coast. They were organized in these um, areas. These representatives themselves, who were fishers, were the ones who were in direct contact with the vessel owners. They were the ones who had to give them the devastating news that they had to relinquish ownership and sign over their boats. They witnessed the helplessness felt by all fishers. One fisher commented, quote, when the document for the sale of my boat was put before me by the representative of my fishing district, I knew I had to sign over my boat. The liaison members shared in the fisher's anguish and despair, despair as they surrender their ownership with tears in their eyes. Those who refused to sign subsequently discovered that their vessels were sold without their consent. Another reason given by the federal government for the speedy and drastic measures was to ensure food supply for the war effort. And that cooperation from the fishers was a, an obligation and a sign of their loyalty. Regrettably, no leader, political, educational, religious, or other, nor any member of the disposal committee dared to ask if ensuring food supply was the reason. Why then were the best fishers being expelled and the newest vessels and equipment being disabled and sold? I asked my father, why didn't you do something? <clears throat> Confrontation from his daughter. <laughs> he told me he went to the wharf and told the sailor guarding the vessels that he was Canadian and that he was taking his boat out. He stopped when the sailor put his rifle to his chest. Several of my father's friends and relatives were sent to jail and shipped to the prisoner of war camp in Angler, Ontario for com com uh, committing simple acts of defiance. They had dared to be out and about after the curfew or did not produce their alien registration card, their ID that they were to carry at all times, or protested against their families being separated. My mother's comment was, what good would it have done to have your father in jail? There was a family to consider. My father was separated from the rest of the family during the year spent in internment. He was sent to work in various road camps while my mother, brother, and I, with our maternal grandparents, were relocated to the ghost town of Greenwood. Greenwood was where the elderly men, like my grandfather, women, and children were sent. My relatives, who had also lived in the close-knit community of Statesden, and also connected to the fishing industry as fishers and boat builders were scattered throughout the interior of BC in various internment camps. In order to stay together as a family, my paternal grandparents, with my uncle and his family, relocated to the sugar beet fields of Emerson, Manitoba. In 1946, they were, they, they were deported to Japan. My uncle, aunt, and cousins were all Canadian born. In 1988, the government of Canada acknowledged that Japanese Canadians were unjustly treated and apologized. The monetary component was symbolic. It was to demonstrate the seriousness of the government in assuming responsibility for past wrongs, to show that redress went beyond work. With the funds the Nikkei National Museum and the new Denver Internment Museums were established and commemorative exhibitions were sponsored. 
in exhibitions such as the Lost Fleet have a powerful role to play to represent, chronicle, and incorporate the stories of suffering and survival into a larger, broader history of Canada. At the same time, the Lost Fleet exhibit makes us wonder. As memory fades with the passing of, older, of, old, of the older generation, is there a danger of it happening again? There are other questions as well. Has the Nikkei community come to terms with the past? Has there been reconciliation? Nikkei fishers were all Canadian citizens. Their citizenship was ignored and trampled on. Their investments were ruined. They could not provide, provide for the family. Were, they were deprived of um, preserving an inheritance to pass on to the next generation. They were labeled as enemy aliens. Their sense of belonging in their adopted and native country was shattered. My grandparents, my father, and most of their generation did not live to see me press to receive an apology or any monetary cons uh, rec restitution for their loss. However, if reconciliation involves a fuller and equal membership in the larger society of which they were once de deprived, then one can say that the process began in 1949 with the restoration of the franchise. It continued into the 50s and 60s with the introduction of social programs to address the everyday <coughs> realities of UK lives and their fears of old age, medical and financial needs, and family responsibilities. My grandfather's reaction after decades of, rea uh, of rejection was that he too was entitled to these benefits. My father-in-law, who lost his farm, expressed it best when Medicare was introduced. He said, if Canada cared enough to provide hospital and medical care to everyone, including me too, then Canada is a good country. Me too now has a different conversation. <laughs> For Nikkei Fishers who returned to the coast and re-entered the industry, Reconcili reconciliation meant the right to fish the entire coast on the same basis as other fishers, to have access to the same fishing grounds, to be welcomed into the same fishing union. They were able to move forward into the future as equals and rebuild their lives. Thank you for your attention. So I think we have a few minutes for, uh, for question and answer. You can stand for your preference. If there are some questions for, for Masako or myself. Yeah? I would like to know how much of that is being taught in schools now, because in the 1960s, it certainly wasn't taught to me. I know. So how much is in the okay. schools, and then maybe um, at what grade level? Um, let's see, that it was, uh, Rick Beardsley is here too, he, he actually uh, started introducing um, the history of Japanese Canadians before uh, even redress happened. I came along and uh, started ha agitating um, for the Ministry of Education to introduce Japanese Canadian history especially the internment and redress um, at the elementary level and at the secondary level. And that was in the, about the year 2000, wasn't it? And when I first approached uh, the ministry, they told me no way. There was no funds. And at that time, they were um, granting other projects. So I asked them, you know, if Jap um, atrocities committed in Canada do not warrant any explanation or teaching in the school district, but those happening out elsewhere, like in Germany and Japan, those were acceptable to be taught. And so I had um, 
quite a, a conversation with the Ministry of Education. Finally, uh, I had to get the community involved, and with their help, we were able to introduce it at the elementary and secondary level. But it's really up to the teachers whether they teach it or not. So it's not part of the curriculum? It is it part is. of the curriculum. There's a resource book for both levels, but if you don't, if teachers are uh, unfamiliar with the history, then you can't expect them to teach it, right? And so it's really important that um, uh, students, uh, like Jordan students, uh, learn about the history. So when they do go, uh, go into the school, into the schools as teachers, that that would be one area they would select to teach because teachers do have a. Uh, option of teaching content. Mass's resources, writing, drawings is prominently displayed in my daughter's fifth grade classroom. Not you to me. No, it's not. Wrong. It's not wrong. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for shedding so much more light. It's really my case on this, uh, this gripping story. Uh, much appreciated. Um, just to come back to the educational part, we have almost every week we have school programs here focusing on the last fleet. So we certainly tell that story to our audiences. You know, for small kids and larger and bigger and older ones like us, uh, we're going to share the information. I was intrigued by the first photograph that you showed of Mr. Kimura. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at his clothing, he's wearing a winter coat. He just puts on his gloves. Could it be that he just left one of these meetings uh, in between January and March? Yeah, know. we don't we know very much about this. Uh, I thought the timing of the photograph, the, the moment, you, the fact that you show the photograph is such a marvelous element. Yeah, we don't know that much about this photo. I don't know if anyone from the Kimura family knows much about the photo. Greg, did you read it? No, I think maybe it's gorgeous. I don't know what that is. It's a classic Fonzie photo. It's not a Fonzie photo from downtown. I think it was a dollar in front of the Morphium Theater and all that. I know that. What were you saying? We had those street photographers. There was a street photographer who was known as Fonzie. And virtually everybody in the city that grew up in the 40s has a family portrait. One of my grandfather and all the oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I never didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah. So he had uh, before LZ. Kimura received permission for his family to stay in Vancouver throughout the uh, internment, actually, but he declined it uh, due to the sense that, that that there was too much racism in the city for a Japanese Canadian family to to uh, remain here. He did continue to return to uh, Vancouver, uh, but I would guess that this is prior to. I would guess that this is prior to, especially if it's a kind of uh, typical, a, a typical uh, sort of kind of uh, touring town photo, uh, mm -hmm. which I didn't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, that would uh, seem like an unlikely thing to do during a, a special trip to a committee meeting. Uh, yeah. But uh, to Mass's point about people not knowing, one of the things that interested me is he certainly, although I don't think he probably took photographs like this, he certainly made no secret within the community that he was uh, traveling to these meetings in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. In fact, came back from Vancouver with stuff like sneakers uh, for other people up in Christina Lake where he was uh, living. So it's a really interesting aspect of this history. Also, I've heard other people say the same, that, you know, but, but, I, but I don't get the sense that he was um, hiding this uh, role, and certainly he received uh, feedback and ultimately resigned from the, uh, from, from the second committee that he served on due to community uh, uh, objection. Mm -hmm. I saw another question right over there, yeah. Uh, as a teacher myself, in terms of the teacher resources, when the project is finished and ready to uh, basically be presented, where will the teacher resources be? Will there be, is there a, a newsletter I can tune into so I can get updated? On sure, it? are you a teacher? Yeah. Yeah, so a couple of things. Uh, one is that over the next few years, uh, what, what level are you in? Secondary. secondary. Secondary, yeah. So this, our secondary resources, probably because the curriculum revisions of the secondary level are coming later than the primary school revisions, uh, our secondary are uh, very much still in the development uh, phase. Uh, the other reason for that is that the secondary sources, the resources, more so than the primary school resources, are really going to integrate our research materials so that students will have a real opportunity to work through uh, uh, the materials. Uh, but um, 
the teachers are developing developing them in part through piloting within uh, classrooms. So if you have an interest in the area, one thing we can do is get you in touch with a network of teachers who are starting to connect with the project and be involved in some of the early development and, and piloting. And then, yeah, all of it we're gonna we're gonna uh, put. It, and there's a real emphasis within the among our community partners to try and get these resources into the hands of as many teachers as possible. So we have the development side, then we have the kind of distribution of promotional side. Uh, and so we'll try to do a very good job of that and certainly uh, get, get them to teachers. But yeah, get, give us your name. We should have, do we have a sign-up sheet? Uh, yeah, should we have a sign-up sheet in the back? And maybe if you just note uh, that, and if you're interested in being involved in some of the uh, process prior to the to the rollout, uh, you know, that's very welcome as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious about uh, I'm newcomer actually from Japan. Um, the, curious about how you or somebody researched how many fishers came back to the West Coast. I mean, I I know you are the author of the Lost Fleet. That was very nice, but but I didn't read. Detail. Only I don't about, remember. Yeah, only about ten percent. Ten percent. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. I just met someone who's uh, a, a geographer actually at the University of Wisconsin, and he's researching his own family's history, and is is uh, a non Nikkei person. His family had different uh, relationships with this with this history. He had some uh, uh, family members who were really promoting the uprooting and internment of Japanese Canadians. Then he had other family members, the Bear Bear mm -hmm. brothers in in uh, in, uh, in the Naimo area, who maintained a relationship with Japanese Canadians. Canadian fishers who they had fished with before the mm -hmm. war, maintained correspondence through the war, and then uh, what was the name of the family that fished with them? The Japanese Canadian family, uh, two brothers, uh, I'm not going to remember the name, but anyway, they, they came back to Nanaimo and reestablished a partnership. William. William. Yeah, reestablished a partnership after uh, after the war, uh, fishing again uh, together. Mm. Although, yeah, they're unusual stories, but they do exist. Mm. Yeah. yeah. There was a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Does did your research give any insight as to why Kimura was sort of selected to sit on this <coughs> committee, or just by virtue of the fact that he wasn't directly involved in the uh, as a fisher, but but more as kind of a broker and agent, or yeah, we're not why, sure. Why I kind of I, I speculate about that in my introduction, but uh, it, it looks like did, did you guys have an inkling about that? Yeah, yeah. I think because he's very bilingual, he was yeah. okay. versed in both Japanese and English. And okay. Yeah, like, so well, I, I would think it was, but this is kind of speculative. Uh, there's in his agenda of his meetings, he had previously had dinner with Motherwell. So he, we have kind of just an agenda of activity. So he knew, somehow he knew personally some of the officials involved. Okay. Yeah, he was fluently bilingual. And presumably they had some impression of him as a person with whom uh, uh, they could work. And they had, and, and uh, he had knowledge of the industry. So I think, but, th but it's not, and I don't have a document that lays out these, these yeah. points, but th that's kind of, the assumption uh, that, that we have, yeah, those kind of combination of things. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and here again, I don't have any document, documentation well, to yes, support my view, but um, in the salt, salted fish uh, industry, um, a couple of years before 41, they were told to, uh, to cease and um, uh, they were taking, they were kind of, ex how can I say this? They were told that the salted salmon that they were uh, using will no longer be uh, salted because they were going to now be canned to supply um, the uh, allies overseas. And so I'm assuming then that Mr. Kimura had some kind of, uh, well, he would have had to negotiate with the uh, officials about things like this when they're closing down your business and he was the, um, uh, the, the leader or the manager of these uh, organizations. I mean, that's one, of, that's a speculation that I have, you know, but it makes sense. 
We should check the agenda entry against the dates of the closure of the salt fish industry and see if the agenda entry corresponds with the, yeah. I have something to add to what uh, Mark was saying. I think um, Kimura in his um, This is our uh, postdoctoral fellow, <laughs> 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 works with our uh, project. Go ahead, uh, so He actually wrote two major memoirs uh, in Japanese language. One was one has to do with the one that Jordan explained and commented on, and the other has to do with the, the fish, sultry, salting, fish salting cooperative that Mass mentioned, and herring and salmon. And I think he was an important figure in establishing that organization, which was comprised of Japanese Canadian fishermen. Um, and that didn't just come into being, it was a result of organized, sustained effort by the fishing community. And I think he was a, a key person in perhaps establishment and also the maintenance of that committee. And to be in a position of, of running or managing such an um, organization, I think he was quite well networked with the people within um, the government, the fishery department or ministry. Um, and we also see that he traveled to Ottawa to speak to some government official so that Japanese fishers uh, could maintain this um, salting business. And remarkably, uh, these people are canning, right? They are salting lots of fish and herring, and they're shipping a lot of this to China, the Chinese market. So it, it's connected with this um, a global economy at the time. So I think his prior involvement in, in that uh, sector was probably something that came to the mind of officials when it came time to eliminate Japanese Canadian fishing industry. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll be here for the, the next period when uh, students are introducing their research as well, so you can certainly come up and ask uh, individual questions. Mike is going to come up and briefly uh, uh, introduce our uh, students. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. So thank you, and thank you again. Yeah, thank you very much.